In all my adventures from the front lines of faraway places, I've seen the impacts of climate change. Yet despite all of these adventures, I hadn't really considered the devastating potential impact climate change will have in my own home region. That's the Great Lakes. As the west coast catches fire and the deserts advance out of the southwest, water is going to become the most important resource around. The Great Lakes hold almost 30% of the world's accessible fresh water. Ontario alone has 250,000 lakes. This place is a paradise, but maybe not for too long. This is gross. This is algae. This is an algae bloom. It's a symptom of a much larger problem that could cause us some serious issues in the future, especially if we have a lot more people moving into the Great Lakes region. When fresh water begins to become scarce, everyone is going to want to move here. The Great Lakes region could become North America's climate refuge, but what would become of our most precious resource? Can the Great Lakes handle a massive influx of people? I'm determined to find out. This is getting as intense as anything I've ever seen. We gotta go south, right now. Situation is rapidly deteriorating. Get into shelter. I'm meteorologist and storm chaser, Mark Robinson. For over two decades, I ventured into the heart of some of the planet's most devastating weather events. The situation here in Nepal is ongoing. I've traveled the globe documenting dozens of tornadic storms, landfalling hurricanes, tropical storms, and volcanoes. I have waited all my life to see this. Nature, in all its majestic and fearsome glory, is a force that can leave us humbled, awestruck, and occasionally terrified. Oh my God. Climate change is shifting everything across North America, where rain falls, how food grows, why people live where they do, and those changes are accelerating. Now, many of us are looking to one of the regions in North America that will be least affected by climate change, the Great Lakes. Climate refugees are not new, and it's going to happen again. But can the Great Lakes act as a climate refuge, and what will the area do to absorb the impending influx? Come with me as I discover the truth about the climate refuge and this incredible region. What is algae? They're microscopic organisms that live in aquatic environments and use photosynthesis to produce energy from sunlight. Kind of like plants, only much simpler. An algae bloom becomes visible when there's so many of these organisms that you can see it with the naked eye. The water can go green, blue-green, red, or brown, depending on the type of algae. Some of these blooms are just unsightly, but aren't directly toxic. Others produce serious toxins that can be ingested by humans, their pets, or wildlife. Both create serious problems for us. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. I did see some algae over here. Oh yeah, oh, yeah there's some of the algae. There. Oh, I see. <laughs> so we're looking at algae blooms sort of as, as part of some of the issues that we're having in the Great Lakes. What is an algae bloom? Essentially a proliferation of algae. So it's when you have too much algae that's growing and that's what's creating that green scum that you sometimes see on a lake. There's actually different kinds of algae blooms. You can have harmful algal blooms, which is actually caused by cyanobacteria, so it's not caused by algae, though we call them blue-green algae. You can also have filamentous algae blooms. You sometimes see this kind of green snotty stuff that's forming on rocks. When you have agriculture, sewage, or other things that are driving nutrients, that can create that algae bloom situation any time of the year. I know from, you know, back in the day, it's sunlight and fertilizers. Yeah. And where are these fertilizers coming from? We apply them to fields for our growth. They're also coming from us. They're in the sewage <laughs> that go through to, to the system. So if sewage is not properly treated, that can lead to algae. Traditional farming practices, for instance, laying fertilizer in a field at a certain time, if you have a storm that comes right after that fertilizer has been laid, a lot of it just goes straight into the waterways. Are you concerned about a lot more people in and around the Great Lakes? It depends on how, how we grow. I think we are definitely gonna have more people coming to the Great Lakes region right now. We're in a climate haven. I think what matters at this point is that we are thinking about how do we grow in a way that's sustainable and that's minimizing nutrients going into the systems. These are all technologies we have. It's just a matter of applying them and make sure that we do that in a smart way. Why should the average Canadian care about algae bloom? 
I think it's important that we care about all aspects of our environment and especially our fresh water. So, if algae blooms are a result of excess nutrients from fertilizer runoff, specifically phosphorus and nitrogen, coinciding with lots of sunlight, warm temperatures, and shallow, slow-flowing water, where's that fertilizer coming from? I made the assumption that it must be the over-fertilizing of farmers' fields as the source, or at least one of them. I wanted to talk to some local farmers to see what fertilizers they're using and if they think about its overall impact on the environment. We wanted to find out how fertilizer is processed at a large-scale farm, so we called up Luke Hanneman. Nice Hi. to meet you. Luke, nice to meet you. Can you take me through a little bit of how fertilizer works? Absolutely. So it's kind of a supply and demand type thing. So there's obviously nutrients in the soil that crops need to grow. So what we do is we take a soil sample, we send it away to a third party lab and they analyze it and then send us a report back of what each nutrient content is in that soil profile. Then we can figure out what crop we're gonna grow next and figure out what the crop demands and then we can use fertilizer to top up the soil to get to the level we need to be for the crop to succeed. We can use urea, is our probably our biggest source in Ontario for, for nitrogen fertilizer, right. monomonium phosphate for phosphorus, and potash for potassium. How critical is fertilizer for an operation on this scale? If we didn't have fertilizer, we'd probably have about 30% of the crop production that we do now. 30%? So that's our, our fertilizer tower. There's a bunch of bins up top that will fill with product. Each bin is designated for its own individual products. So there's six or seven different products we can have on hand at one time. Right. And then we get the recipe that the customer wants. And then we can uh, measure and weigh exactly how much of each fertilizer that customer wants uh, into our scale. And then it goes from the scale into a blender and it mixes those products together. And then we can put it in our fertilizer spreader and apply it to the customer. So literally so like you drive that up underneath that thing and- That's it, right. Okay, yep. you gotta show me this thing. So you dump it in here. Yeah, we dump the fertilizer in here, and right. then it goes up that big uh, stainless pipe there, and then uh, into one of the storage bins before we put it in the blender. And then where does it come out? It comes out of this pipe either into a fertilizer spreader or in a truck to get shipped to the field. Is there an alternative to large-scale farming? What happens when we use organic fertilizers like manure? Oh this wait, what's this? Swiss chard. Oh, it is Swiss yeah, chard, yeah. okay. My wife will be more than a little bit happy. She is so yeah. good at cooking this oh, stuff. Oh, great. I've heard the term no-till farming. What is that? What they are, kind of what it sounds like. So no-till farming, the idea being that you leave the soil alone, that you're gonna, one, build up the soil health. That's kind of like the backbone of it. A kind of climate change reason for lower no-till farming is that the ground, the soil, is the best carbon capture method that we have. Every spring, when conventional farmers till up, deep tilling their soil, that will release carbon into the air. Uh, we, of course, want to do the opposite. We want to keep carbon in the ground. Right. Healthier soil will lead to healthier crops. Having carbon in the ground will help battle the climate crisis. So are you using fertilizer? Because of the, the no or low-till farming, I don't use a lot of fertilizer. So in practice, what it looks like is back here, we have a, a field of green salad greens, spinach, arugula. Those have timelines. So when they bolt, go to seed, so I mow them down and tarp it. And then for about a week, I leave that tarp on, which speeds up decomposition, take the tarp off and I seed right into that. So it's an integrated fertilization system. It's natural, it's, yeah. it's just, it's plant. It's, right, it's, right. it's whatever comes out of the soil, drains into this creek. There's no harm of it getting into, into the water system. There is a problem though. Right now, organic farming needs about 20% more land to produce the same amount of food that an industrial farm does. This need for more land for farming will compete directly with the need for more housing as people move into the Great Lakes region. Yeah, you can go for it. <laughs> it's gonna be a little strong. The cellar you get at the store, they, they heavily Woo! irrigate. And that's not because it's organic, it's just because of the amount of water you use. It's the amount of water. Can we scale something like this up? From my experience, um, I've managed other farms that are you know dozens of acres in size, so again, not yeah. those huge scales, 
but we would use cover cropping for doing the dozens of acres easily. I know conventional farmers who also use it at scale, you know, doing hundreds of acres as a way of holding soil, building that fertility right there. What's nice is that it composts right on the soil. Yeah. All these things, when the winter comes, will just die right there and compost right on site. So I would say it's a great option. Is it possible to feed the number of people we have right now, never mind this huge amount of people that may be moving in. Like, can, can we do it? We're gonna need a lot of different options to, to get through things. As we're navigating new times, we need to be aware that there are other solutions. You know, from a personal level, hydroponics, you can grow some lettuce up north. Yeah. It's not organic, but it's a great way of growing lettuce in a northern environment, which makes it more accessible to more people. So we know that the use of fertilizers remains essential for modern agriculture, as they help ensure high crop yields and food security. However, there's an ongoing emphasis on developing more sustainable and environmentally responsible fertilizer practices to mitigate their negative impact on the environment and ensure the long-term health of the planet. All of that water sitting in the Great Lakes is a huge resource, but as we've learned, there's a lot more than just water floating around in there. We're standing here in the control room of what am I looking at here? What you're looking at is the first part of a wastewater treatment plant right. that is a huge toilet for <laughs> half a million people. When I flush my toilet, everything goes down, magic happens, and then water goes out into the lake. Take me through the process. You know that magic box is divided into a number of processes. Each step of the process, you're doing one thing only. It's separating solids, and liquids. One of the things we're dealing with when we talk about algae blooms and, and some of the water quality is the nitrogen and phosphorus. Take me through how that's removed. The water that we put out into the lake has to be non-toxic. Right. Has not to affect any of the fish. Right. So we have processes like chlorine. We add a chemical in there to take that chlorine out. There are processes there that will reduce your unionized ammonia that goes to the lake. Right, so it goes uh, ammonia, nitrate, nitrite, nitrite and then nitrogen. Nitrogen. The other part is phosphorus. Right. Phosphorus comes from a lot of places, including agriculture, including products. Phosphorus is not good for the lake because phosphorus is a feeder for organisms. So well, that's, and that's the algae blooms that we were That's the yeah. algae blooms. So we add a chemical to precipitate that phosphorus out ah, in the wastewater plant. Right. So the, a lot of it comes out in the solids because we add a chemical that precipitates phosphorus out. I'd always assumed that the algae bloom problem in the Great Lakes was caused mostly by fertilizer runoff from the farms that surround its waters. As it turns out, I wasn't quite correct. While fertilizer runoff is part of the problem, the other part of the problem is the sewage that we create in the rapidly growing cities on the Great Lakes shores. But it's not all bad news. We can scale up those sewage treatment plants. There is still room to scale up those treatment plants and fertilizer, it's expensive. So farmers aren't using quite as much as I originally thought. So the next big question is, how do we grow our cities without overwhelming our infrastructure? <laughs>